so let's talk about uh, let's talk about trade. Obviously, we, we all know. I mean, Mitch McConnell knows it. He doesn't want to say it for a lot of a lot of uh, political reasons. But tariffs are like taxes. They hurt Americans, and right now, American farmers and working class Americans are being hurt. What what can you tell us about? Oklahoma, who's being hurt by the tariffs in Oklahoma, and is it is the pain that uh, is worth uh, your constituents uh, experiencing to get a better deal with China? So what's interesting is most of my constituents and the folks that I talk to in Oklahoma do want to see a deal with China. They do see the fact that we've had decades of dispute with China. China has been unfair in its trade practices. Uh, they're not necessarily looking to win. They're just looking to open up markets and to be able to have a fair exchange. Right now, what we're experiencing is re uh, retaliatory tariffs on agricultural products, so it's harder to get ag products in. Uh, we see the tariffs that have been imposed, what are called the 301 tariffs. You'll heard those uh, kicked around all the time. Uh, these 301 tariffs are directly hurting some Oklahoma companies. Uh, we've got a uh, company in Oklahoma, for instance, that produces LED lighting products. They do the design, the engineering, the sales, intellectual property patents. All of those things are in Oklahoma, but they do their manufacturing in China, and then they're delivered to Home Depot and Lowe's and Walmart and Target and all those places. You, you've seen a lot of their products. That company has paid millions of dollars in tariffs over the last uh, year uh, and was scheduled to pay millions of dollars more. It's not a Chinese company that's paying that. It's an American company, and ultimately that will cause a rise in prices for a lot of these products for the consumers. So it directly hurts American companies, uh, and it, it does bring people to the table to talk, but I hope it also brings some urgency uh, to be able to get some resolution. And what kind of farmers are being hurt uh, the most by the tariffs in Oklahoma? Well, it, it, it depends on the week, actually, and what uh, the Chinese are doing. For a, a moment, they stopped on soybeans for, uh, for a while. They stopped taking shipments. And then as the negotiations were ongoing, they looked like they were going well. The Chinese started purchasing a large amount of soybeans and turned that off. But then it becomes cotton, or then it becomes beef, or then it becomes corn. Uh, so it kind of alternates around. But it does have a definite destabilizing effect because, as you know, farmers can't just switch crops on a dime. Uh, they've got to actually plan in advance what they're going to do, get that all scheduled out and ready to go and certain crops only work in certain regions. Uh, so when the Chinese move around uh, what their different retaliatory tariffs will be, it has a real effect. So, uh, Senator, uh, as conservatives, you and I have, have long believed uh, the power of open markets and the power of free trade. But we've also understood, and something even in the ice age when I was in Congress back in 95, 6, 7, I was complaining and a lot of us were complaining even on the Republican side about the Chinese stealing intellectual property, uh, persecuting Christians and other religious minorities. Now, of course, there may be two million Muslims in the concentration camps over, over in China. How do, how do you, as a conservative today, balance your belief in free trade with the importance of getting China to finally move after, again, what, I said 95? That's like 24 years ago, almost a quarter century. We've been going through this with very little progress. How do you balance those two things? And at what point do you tell the president, Mr. President, enough, we've got to get the best deal we can get? Well, I, th I think you do push on the human rights issues. That's one of the areas that I pushed on pretty hard when we were talking about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, is anytime we engage with other countries uh, with any kind of trade negotiations, that is a unique moment for us to talk about issues like religious freedom, free press, freedom of speech, freedom of movement. Uh, those are uniquely American values that are really human rights values worldwide uh, that we want to continue to be able to push out, and trade negotiations are the moments to talk about those things. So I think we do continue to be able to drill down on those things, uh, but we've also got to be able to to open up markets. We, we as Americans, uh, we forget at times in the Declaration of Independence, one of the complaints we had against King George was he was prohibiting our free trade with people around the world. We've been free traders as Americans before we were even Americans as a country. Uh, this is something that we have done always and we will continue to be able to do uh, to be able to trade with other countries. And we're places that block us out. We've either got to be able to push that and restore it or we've got to decide we're not going to be there at all. But if we're going to be there and trade with China, we want to have an open, fair market, not have them steal our intellectual property. Let's talk about religious persecution for a moment because back in, back in uh, the late 90s, I actually worked with Abe Rosenthal, legendary uh, former editor of the New York Times, on the topic of Christian persecution. We talked about what was happening in China. Right now, of course, there still is persecution of Christians and other religious minorities. Uh, but uh, again, I, I want to go back to 
the situation where one to two million Muslims, uh, according to the Pentagon, two million Muslims uh, are being put into concentration camps. What can you tell Americans about that? And what can you and the United States Senate do uh, to, again, in our lifetime, concentration camps because right. people worship uh, their God? What, what can you do? What can the Senate do? What should the president do? to bring relief to these these uh, believers in the God of Abraham who are suffering the hands of the Chinese authorities. So the, the Chinese have moved a group of Muslims into what they're calling re-education camps, uh, which we would call concentration camps, isolating them, saying that they're going to re-educate them towards a more Chinese way, uh, trying to be able to limit their access to other people, trying to be able to manage who they are. Facial recognition is tracking every place that they go. They're managed in their travel. Uh, th this is true isolation for a group of people solely because of how they worship and who they worship. We saw this in Christian churches a few years ago where the Chinese went in and made crosses that were public crosses on the outside of churches all come down. Even officially recognized state churches had to remove it because you had to be uniquely Chinese, not recognizing any kind of religious faith or any kind of difference, saying your first identity is not to your faith, your first identity is to China. Our founders in the United States, our founders saw our faith as a unique private <coughs> possession uh, and that the government can't reach in and try to remove someone's faith just like they can't take away a, a private property right from somebody. That is unique private <coughs> property. So we have, uh, we have actively worked towards isolating China, calling it a con country of particular concern uh, for State Department uh, regulations uh, and for sanctions, uh, multiple letters, trying to expose them in the public media, trying to be able to expose to the world this is not an area that we agree with, with China. Uh, this is similar to what was done with Tibet years ago uh, to be able to focus in and not isolate uh, allow people to be isolated, but allow people to have free travel and movement. Senator Langford, it's Willie Geist. It's good to see you this morning. I want to ask you good about you, a boy. different question, which is Iran. And the news this morning that the State Department is evacuating non-emergency employees from the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad because the State Department says there is a threat from Iranian-backed forces to Americans in Iraq. Some people have disputed that claim, including the British, uh, who's in charge of the troops in and the allied troops there, who has said, we do not see an uptick in violence from Iranian-backed forces. There was a story in the New York Times that a plan was being devised to send 120,000 troops potentially to fight Iran. We have the USS Abraham Lincoln Carrier Strike Group moving into the Persian Gulf. Obviously, last year, the withdrawal from the Iran deal. With the Iraq war still very fresh in the mind, of the American people, a lot of people see a drumbeat beginning toward perhaps a war with Iran. Are you concerned about that? Now, I'm always concerned about a war with Iran because Iran has been a very warlike nation. Uh, what is happening in Yemen right now is because Iran is stoking the controversy and providing weapons in Yemen and stoking that fight as a proxy fight uh, with Saudi Arabia. Iran was the one propping up Bashir Assad in Syria. They sent a lot of their Revolutionary Guard and other fighters into Syria to be able to fight with Assad in his murder of his own people. Uh, we saw this in Iraq as well. When we were in Iraq in that war, Iran was pushing technology that killed, th uh, killed over a thousand of our United States soldiers that were there based on weaponry and technology that Iran was pushing in to attack us. So this is Iran's mode. Uh, so we do need to be careful and cautious knowing that Iran does mean business in this. So when we push uh, forces into that area, it is responding to what Iran is doing, not trying to push towards a war. And quite frankly, our beef is not with the Iranian people, it's with the regime that's there. That regime in Iran, they've seen a green revolution uh, years ago because the individuals within Iran yeah. are frustrated with their own regime because they're taking money and sending it to Hezbollah and sending it to terrorists. Uh, groups rather than taking care of their own people. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anybody would argue with you that Iran has been a bad actor around the world and continues to be. But do you believe the steps we've seen recently, particularly with John Bolton as national security advisor, a man who makes no secret of his problems with Iran and perhaps his uh, wish to do something about the regime in Iran, do you believe that we are on the precipice of a war with Iran? I do not. And I, and I don't blame John Bolton for wishing that the Iranian people had better leadership. I think the, the people of Iran, many of them wish that they had different leadership as well. But that's up to the Iranian people to be able to make that transition. I, I can tell you what the British leadership has said. They haven't seen an uptick in forces is very different uh, than what uh, someone saying there has been an uptick in threats. 
Uh, if we have intelligence information saying that the Iranians are planning to do something against American forces in Iraq, we should take that seriously. That doesn't take additional forces. They already have forces on the ground there. So in some ways, I'm going to split hairs with you to say the British leadership wasn't disagreeing with us. They aren't seeing more forces. We're just seeing intelligence uh, saying that there are additional threats on our forces. I'll just, just read you the quote, too. There has been no increased threat from Iranian-backed forces in Iraq and Syria from the British deputy commander of the coalition fighting there in ISIS, Senator. I, I would say our intelligence disagrees with that. And the intelligence that I have read only in that we have increased threats from them, not necessarily increased people on the ground from Iraq, uh, in Iraq, but they do have forces on the ground right now. And if they choose to be able to carry out an attack, they have the capability of doing it. All right, Senator James Langford, thank you very much for coming on the show this morning. I'm very glad to be able to be with you.